Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, today's webinar. Today, we're looking at Tether Capture into Capture One Pro 8, uh, which is even better than it was in version 7. And we'll show you all uh, the new features today and uh, have a look at other things like uh, file management, uh, connection of the camera considerations, uh, and all things like that. Uh, if we get time, we'll have a look at Capture Pilot as well, which is our OS application for viewing the shoot uh, wirelessly. Okay, so uh, if this is your first webinar, so you know who you're listening to, my name's David. I'm part of the software marketing team based out of Copenhagen in uh, Denmark. Uh, we've got 45 to uh, 60 minutes uh, with each other uh, with ourselves today. Uh, probably, I imagine we go through uh, to the full 60 minutes because there's so much good stuff in Tethered Capture. Uh, you are very welcome and encouraged to ask questions throughout on today's subject. Uh, the way you do that, if you look at the bottom of your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see a section called uh, questions. Just type in a question and um, that will come straight through to me. Equally, if you're on your iPad, iPhone, etc., or Android device, you'll see a question mark icon on the screen, same as before, and uh, it will um, come again straight through to me. Okay. Um, one thing to mention that is new about tethering, we go straight into Capture One in a second. I've, I've got a Nikon hooked up, but just so you know, uh, we can also support as well as Canon, Nikon, and um, Leaf cameras, of course, and Phase One cameras. Uh, we can also support some Sony cameras tethered as well. Uh, it's not quite full functionality yet in the fact that you'll see today that you can adjust um, your uh, settings from um, Capture One for the Nikon and Canon, like shutter speed, ISO, and so on. So you can't quite do that yet with Sony, but you can shoot directly into Capture One. So as you can see on screen, uh, that's a very nice A7R, um, just to give you an idea that we can do it. Um, in terms of uh, cable consideration, uh, I'm actually using what you can see on screen now, which is a little tether tools jerk stopper. Uh, and that's just like a, a removable clip you can see from the camera, which clamps around the cable and it just takes uh, the strain uh, away. Um, certainly on the Nikon D800, which I've got hick, uh, hooked up, the USB 3 design, of course, is pretty awful as connectors go. It's not the most solid connection. Uh, so that little gadget really helps to sort things out. So let's move on and look at uh, Capture One itself. So I just need to uh, switch over screens and get the uh, questions panel up as well. OK, uh, Richard was asking, where do you get the stopper and lead from? Uh, it's a company called Tether Tools. Uh, you can get them all over the world. So they have uh, worldwide distribution and they do all kinds of stuff for tethering. Really, really nice gear. Um, and that's just a, a really neat little device that that helps enormously for, for cable management. So let's start by talking a little bit about uh, file management. So in Capture One, if you didn't know, oh, before we get started, one thing I always forget to do is turn on the mouse locator. So if you're wondering where the mouse is, it's in the crosshairs like so. It just helps you to locate a bit better. Um, so we talk a little bit about file management. Now in Capture One, if you're not aware, you can uh, either store your images in a session or you store your images in a catalog or library as you might know it. Um, a session is particularly good for uh, shooting tethered and hopefully I will prove to you why over the next uh, minutes or so. Uh, what you're looking at on screen, this was just me uh, setting up and, and checking earlier, but a session is really, really simple. And uh, if I just do a right click up on the top of the screen, I'll show you exactly what the session is and we go through with actually setting one up. So when you set up a session, you end up with a folder and it has a nest of folders inside it. This is the most basic session layout you can have. Uh, a capture folder, an output folder, a selects folder and a trash folder. This little file that you see here, CoSession DB, this is the database that um, um, 
basically describes how the, the, the session is needs to be viewed in Capture One. So you don't really have to worry about that. So that's all a session is. It's just simply a nest of folders. The great thing is about a session, if you're working in the studio and then you want to move the session to, let's say, from a laptop to a, a retouch station, all you need to do is grab the whole folder and drag that wherever you wish. So the, the session is completely portable. It has everything you need in there to move uh, the session around. How do you make a session? Very simple. And there's a couple of new things that are in um, Capture One as well. So let me just close uh, this session down. Uh, let's make sure I can see your questions. Uh, yes, Alberto, there is a spot in the upper left-hand corner. I just noticed that myself as well. Uh, let's go back to uh, Capture One, and we're going to say New Session, or you can say the same up here, File, New Session. So let's just say a New Session. Ask you for a name. Uh, so let's just call this Webinar uh, Tethered Session like so and that's pretty much all you need to do you have a location so this is where you want the master folder to be um, you can change that location by hitting this button here and then basically by default it will call capture folder capture the selects folder selects the output output and the trash trash very simple and the capture name this is the the, the name of the uh, uh, the image how it will be called so you can change that here if you just wanted that to be called something more simple that's all you have to do to set up a session say OK, Capture One will pop open, and there you go, you're ready to go. Now, if we just do a right click on here again, then you'll see Webinar Tethered Session. It's just created those various folders like so. Really super, super simple. Uh, a new thing that uh, we have in uh, Capture One 8 is called a template. Now, as I said earlier, this is the most basic session that you can have. But to be honest, let's say we're doing a fashion shoot throughout the day. It's unlikely we're going to put all the captures into one capture folder. We want to split them up into our, our different looks as such. So in the finder, I can make a new folder here. Let's say call this shot one. And then we can make another folder, shot two, another folder, shot three, whoops, get that right, shot three, and so on. Now, to get these folders recognized in the session, all you have to do is drag and drop over here to session favorites, like so. So now I've got three different shot folders that at any point I can uh, capture images into. Uh, to make this active as the shot folder, all we need to do is right click on it and say set as capture folder like so. And uh, you'll see a little camera icon there like so, and that means this is now the capture folder. Uh, we'll actually do this in real life when we start shooting. Now, of course, it would be pretty annoying if you had to set up this every single time that you did a tethered session, like especially if you always use the same format, having to create these folders and so on. So we've done something new called uh, a session template, and the template actually saves Funnily enough, how you set up your session. So not only does it include things like here, like session favorites, uh, it also includes uh, settings that you might make to, uh, we we'll come back to these, like next capture naming, settings in Capture Pilot, for example, uh, if you've made any additional session albums here, all kinds of stuff it saves in the template. Uh, to, so let's say you wanted to save this session structure as a template with your shot one, two, and three folder. All you need to do would be say, save as template, like so. And then give your template a name, David's standard template, for example. And then that becomes available whenever you make a new session. So I've made one which is a little bit more complicated. So let's close this session down. We'll say new session. Uh, let's call this, um, it's not fashion. We do still life shoot. And you see under here, template, there's my various different uh, templates. So I'm going to use the one I made uh, yesterday, my session template, like so. See, it clears the rest of the window um, because um, uh, obviously we don't need to make those choices and say OK. And what you'll see is that I have 
various favorites here. I've got a folder called Lighting Test, which is de designated, excuse me, as my capture folder. Four other shop folders. Uh, I've changed my naming convention, for example. Um, I've set Capture Pilot to only show five star images. We'll have a look at Capture Pilot later, as I said, and a few other things. If we look at the session in um, the Finder, then you can see Still Live Shoot. I've got my Capture Folder lighting test, four short folders, and so on. So really simple to build a template, uh, means you can get up and running faster. Uh, yes, Henrik, you can do uh, the same on the PC as well. Even though I'm running on a Mac, uh, you can do all exactly the same stuff on uh, the PC too. Um, so we've got our camera connected via USB. Uh, you can see here uh, in the capture tab that we're showing Nikon D800 like so. Now, a couple of things about connection um, when you first connect a camera if you look in uh, preferences under capture right here uh, you'll see here we've got uh, a list called providers so leaf mamiya canon nikon sony uh, now if you're a canon shooter then you have to make sure that nikon and sony are not checked uh, because funnily enough, they don't play nice together. So we have basically from Canon an SDK and from Nikon an SDK and from Sony an SDK, uh, which allows us to tap into the camera. But it's best to only have one SDK active. If you connect to Nikon and you've got Canon checked, then Capture One will actually ask you uh, that this needs to be changed and then it will restart. So it's pretty much automatic. Just be aware that there is some adjustments here as such. Uh, when you are connecting your uh, camera, try to go direct to your computer. Um, certainly on the Mac, um, this is the first time I've used this Mac on a on a webinar. It's a new MacBook Pro, but on my previous Mac, which was older, uh, 2011, there's two USB sockets on it on the left. The nearest USB socket to me never successfully connected a camera. Uh, the next socket down. Uh, always successfully connect to the camera. So if you have connection issues, it's more than likely something going on with USB, uh, bad cable, and so on. Um, if you always have problems, then the best way to go about it is buy a decent quality powered uh, USB uh, hub. And that way you know you've got plenty of power on the USB um, line to uh, uh, to compensate for that. As I said, this is the first time I've used my Mac. I don't know which USB port is better or if they're both the same. So hopefully I've picked uh, the right one. Um, the Nikon is USB 3. So I'm going directly into the laptop, which is USB 3. I did try it on a hub as well, but I actually get faster capture going directly into uh, the laptop. So that's something to consider as well. Uh, Rich is asking, are we planning to support Fuji X mount cameras for tethered capture? Good question. Um, it depends a bit, really. We're, we're happy to support anyone. It's just uh, we obviously need a certain amount of information from uh, the manufacturer to be able to do that. Um, for example, SDKs and things like that. As far as we know, Fuji doesn't supply anything like that. Uh, so currently, we don't have a solution for Fuji. Um, but obviously, that doesn't mean we can't do it. It just means that there isn't a simple way to do it uh, right now. But who knows uh, in the future? And that's the same for any manufacturer as, as well. Uh, Nikon, Canon, Sony, very easy to work with, easy to uh, add support. So we've got our camera connected on a uh, USB. Uh, you can see it popping up here, camera Nikon D800. We can change various things like uh, the format that we're shooting in, the ISO, uh, the white balance, and so on and so forth. Uh, under camera controls, we can change the various program modes. For example, uh, aperture priority I'm set, so I can change my uh, aperture, uh, exposure adjustment, and so on. I had hoped to shoot in daylight today, uh, but there is no daylight today. <laughs> so I've got a pretty bad light source. So just excuse the quality of photography you're going to see. But this is to uh, demonstrate uh, Capture One, of course. So once we're connected, uh, if we remind ourselves, uh, I've got lighting test is designated as my capture folder. So of course, uh, when I make a capture, I can do that by hitting capture here. And then the camera will click and you'll see pending. And then the image pops in. Super nice and fast. Capture One 8 is faster for 
um, shooting tether definitely. Uh, for, for Nikon and Canon, for sure, it's much better. So every time we hit capture, then uh, you'll see the pending bar and uh, the image uh, pops in like so. So you can capture from here, or of course you can press uh, the shutter button on the camera as well, which I'll do now. Um, and you can shoot much faster if you're uh, clicking the camera itself. So I don't know if you'll be able to hear the shutter, but if I lean over, so that was a volley of not sure how many shots, but you can see them zipping into the uh, uh, the session now. Really, really nice and fast. The speed of that is influenced, obviously, on your connection and also the speed of your hard drive. I'm writing to a terabyte SSD, uh, so it's it's blazingly fast, as, as you can see. So you don't really get any delay at all. So if you're shooting fashion uh, or anything that's fast moving, uh, tethering will not slow you down in that respect. It's super, super fast. So this is all fairly self-explanatory in terms of camera controls. Don't have to tell you much about here. If you go up to the uh, camera menu, then you'll see you've got a few other different options as well. Uh, first one is uh, composition mode. This is really good for you uh, shooting uh, still life. So if we go to composition mode, you'll see you have these X icons in the corners. This basically means if we, um, this is my last shot here, number 61. You can see number 60, number 61. What happens in composition mode if we capture again? Uh, you'll see I get shot number 62. If I capture again, you'll see uh, number 62 has gone. So composition mode only saves the last image that you've captured. So this is for setting up your lighting, exposure, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so this is why there's big X's all over the screen, because obviously you don't want to do an entire shoot uh, with <laughs> composition mode uh, turned on. Uh, just to reiterate, everything is going into a lighting test. So not that we've got much light uh, today. So if I do a right click up here, oops, and just show you. So capture lighting test. There's all the images popping in like so. The session folders you see here, this, this capture folder, if I click that, it will show me whatever is designated as the capture folder right now. So let's say I'm happy with my uh, lighting. Let's turn composition mode off. I could go to shot one here and say this is now my capture folder, like so. So now if I capture again, by the way, there's another shortcut for capture up here. And you see that's going to pop in now into this folder. If we look into the finder, you can see now. They're popping into shot one like so. Easy peasy. So the session system is really simple for managing uh, big shoots like this. Back to the camera menu, a uh, hot folder. Uh, if you want to shoot tethered with something that Capture One doesn't support. Um, so if there is some other way to shoot tethered, like uh, for example, Sony had uh, a remote camera control application. Uh, so for example, you could uh, shoot to uh, a hot folder and uh, this way it will auto import into uh, capture one so before capture one eight that was the way to shoot tethered with sony so for example if there's a utility for fuji like that for example then you could shoot tethered uh, using the hot folder system all you have to do is turn on uh, hot folder enabled and then uh, select the hot folder so that would be your, the the same folder that you've set in your manufacturer's uh, tether application this one here, auto select new capture, never immediately when ready. When ready is the default. Uh, so basically, if I do a capture now, you'll see the image pop up down here as a thumbnail. And then a split millisecond later, it's then displayed on screen. But it's so fast that it's barely, uh, barely uh, noticeable. On a slower machine, what happens is, is that it won't show you the image up on the main screen until the color profile has been um, uh, applied and adjusted and so on and so forth. Uh, so, so that's the reason for that option. Uh, never basically means if you don't want your clients crowding around your machine looking at new captures coming in, you'll see as you capture, it's just sticking on number 68, but other new captures are coming in. So that's quite good. If you don't want the model being distracted by new shots coming in, the client's not being distracted by new shots coming in, then you can simply turn it off, which is uh, really handy sometimes. Auto pause is for, uh, for your digital technicians. If they have auto pause on, basically uh, images will come through as um, 
normal. But if they, for example, if, if you're shooting tethered uh, and then uh, they want to look at, say, image number 67, you can still shoot tethered, um, but they can check focus, for example. They can make adjustments, but it will lock on the image that they're, they're looking at. Um, as soon as they kind of go hands off the software, then the images will start um, popping up uh, again. Okay, just saw a question from Marco. Uh, he says he always receives a message saying cannot connect to capture server, disabling tether capture and live view. I'm not sure what camera that is, Marco. Just let us know what camera that is. Um, probably the easiest thing if you have, a, oh, Nikon D700, thanks. If you have any issue with tethering like that, the first thing is remember, check your cable, check the USB port, use a powered hub if you can. If you're still having issues, get in touch with support because um, you shouldn't have any issues at all really with tethering. It's, it's super, super rock solid on, on version eight as it was on version seven. So please get in touch with support. You'll get a res response in, uh, well, we say 24 hours, but you'll normally get uh, uh, a response um, uh, quicker than that. So just get in touch with support and then they're definitely gonna help you out. Uh, just to finish up on this window here, uh, orientation on the Nikon, it's it's fixed by the camera, so I can't force uh, that at all. Uh, you'll see here capture, takes a picture, of course. Uh, come on, K is a shortcut uh, for you as well. Now, in terms of adjustments, by default, it will copy the last adjustment. So let's say if we go to um, drop saturation a bit, for example, and maybe add some clarity or whatever, and make a few tweaks, of course, on the next capture. Uh, that's going to be reflected. So if we look at the adjustments that we just made, they're all the same. That's uh, uh, the default way Capture One works. You make an adjustment, it's carried over to the next image. Now, like with all, uh, like with always working with images in Capture One, that's not. Um, a uh, adjustment that can't be changed. So even though I've captured this adjustment here, of course, you're free to, to go and adjust more and then take another capture as such. S simple, simple, simple. You can shoot in other ways. So you'll see by default copy from last, but if uh, you're using a capture one style, let's say you've built um, uh, various different capture one styles and uh, a style is simply a collection of different adjustments in Capture One. There are some built-in styles. So let's say we pick one, by example, I'll just take the first one, black and white with some uh, film grain, for example. Uh, if I make a capture, like so, what you'll see is it applies that style immediately. And you can see we've got black and white with a, a film grain effect, like so. If I wanted to adjust that, I can. Uh, so let's say I wanted to just lift the exposure a bit, change the contrast, um, have a bit of clarity, for example. Uh, so I've now adjusted that style. So all I have to do now is just say, copy from last, make a capture, and away we go. We're now shooting with uh, my uh, uh, black and white style, for example. Okay, so uh, Miguel was saying he had a similar issue with Capture One Seven uh, as Marco did, um, but with Capture One Eight, it's perfect. So that's great. Glad to know that it's uh, all up and running. Next, capture naming. Uh, this I set up as part of my template. Very simple. Uh, by default, it's just name and the camera counter. Uh, very, uh, very straightforward. Uh, if you click on the button here, what you see is the naming format menu, and this is based on drag and drop tokens. So if you wanted to have a, a date at the end, you could simply grab um, current date like so, drag and drop that to the naming format. And you'll see some of them have a pull down arrow, which means you can change uh, the various options like that. So day, month, year. You can also type in here. So if you wanted to have uh, an underscore, for example, you could just type that in. Uh, and if we said, uh, okay, you can now see that's what my naming format is going to look like, for example. So next capture again. So command K to capture. And then you'll see the image pop up with uh, the date like so. If you want to save those as a preset, don't forget you can. So I have made this new preset so you can just say save user preset like so. A couple of handy things which uh, are up here. 
So reset capture counter. So if you're not using the camera counter, you can just use a capture one counter, uh, which is this one here, one digit counter. But if you click and hold, you can change that to other number counters. So if you want to reset that back to zero, you can. Let's say on your lighting test, you've run up 300 shots and you just want to go back to one. You can reset the capture counter. You can set it to a particular number um if you wish and you can also set the increment so instead of counting up in one two three four five you could go two four six eight ten for example why would you want to do that um if you're copying books that's why so you can capture even pages then all pages then when they're assembled together you get your pages uh, running so there's a couple of things there that's that's accessed by clicking on the three dots there reset set the number set uh, the count up increment like so uh, next capture location uh, that's basically the same as what we're setting in here but you can adjust it see we've got this one designated as capture folder but you could uh, uh, set it here as well shows you how much space you've got left on the drive so 17,000 captures worth 760 gigabytes so plenty to go I think the rest here is pretty uh, self-explanatory now something else uh, we've um, improved is a uh, live view uh, so if you have live view capability on your uh, camera, uh, for example, um, then um, you'll also be able to see the same in Capture One. So the way to start it is this little uh, movie symbol here. So if we say start live view, then live view opens up like so, and live view is now uh, running. Um, the difference between this and version seven is that we've added uh, a few uh, other things so the quality is a bit better I think on the Nikon now compared to everything else um, if I just carefully uh, go over to where I'm shooting and just wave a pen in front of the camera so you can see that it's about I think it varies but it's about 20 to 30 frames per second your webinar output is about 10 frames per second so I don't know how smooth it will look but it's it's pretty much exactly what you'd expect looking on uh, the back of the camera you can see it in color if you wish by clicking RGB up in the the top left I don't tend to bother um, what is great about a uh, live view let's just sit down again without tripping over various cables uh, if I zoom into 100% double click on the image itself and you see we get this nice high quality focus window now over here on live view controls some of these might be deactivated lightness and quality is for phase and leaf uh, products so you won't be able to adjust that but what you can adjust is the focus so you've got six buttons here uh, the outermost button does a course control so you see that adjusted focus by a long way so we can go back this way this is medium adjustment so tap 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 you can see the focus changing and this is super fine adjustment in the middle uh, so if we want to set the focus on say violet for example then we can just pretty much get it nailed like that without having to touch the camera obviously if I can turn I can turn the focus ring on the lens as well um, but how often are you that close to the camera to your tether station it's much easier to do it from the uh, the live view controls as such now if you have um a nikon d800 there's a couple of weird things you have to do <laughs> to get this working because of the sdk uh, your focusing must be on af continuous you have to disable focusing on the half press of the shutter button and then everything works just fine so set to AFC and disable focusing on the half press of the shutter button I don't think it's the same with Canon it's just a weirdness with the Nikon SDK because what happens otherwise if uh, if you uh, have AF set to half press on the shutter button as soon as you try and capture the camera wants to focus which is really annoying if you've just set the focus in on the right spot so disable AF on the shutter release send it to the rear button and uh, change it to AF continuous, then it works. Uh, Richard's asking, does uh, live view burn the center of use for a long time? No, not really. I mean, you'd have to have it running for an enormous long time. Plus the camera will shut down if, uh, uh, if it gets too hot anyway there's there's safety built into that in the camera anyway. You can in the preferences, I think, um, set 
live view preview pause after five minutes so if you if you're worried you can set the live 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 preview time you can scroll around so if i want to move to a new spot and we can do so like so uh, opens up pretty fast uh, there's a live view focus meter but this is only for you on phase and leaf uh, products um, that basically means you can click a crosshair on a spot and then it will give you a digital representation of what the focus is is uh, looking like uh, if we have it um, we get some live view info but that's based on the camera so uh, but currently we don't get anything from Nikon uh, in that respect uh, let's double click to uh, zoom out uh, Tom's asking how well does live view work with the Leaf Credo backs? Very well, actually. Um, it's not as fluid as using the Canon or Nikon because the frame rate is so high on the Canons and Nikons. So it's not quite the same as uh, on uh, uh, the Leaf and Phase 1 stuff. Unless you're on an IQ 250 or a Leaf Credo 50, then the live view is really fast. So almost as good as this, if not as good because uh, it's a CMOS sensor and we get much faster frame rate off uh, the CMOS sensor. Uh, Henrik said he can't get the focus buttons to work with phase one. Uh, just just drop a note to support. It could be you might need to update firmware or if the camera body isn't compatible and and so on. Uh, Fernando is saying I've configured the back button for focus. Is that OK? Yes, that's exactly uh, the right thing to do. Then it works nicely. So a few other things uh, we can do with live view. If you look up some buttons up here, uh, you've got uh, grid and guidelines. The orange guidelines you can just move around so you can position your objects where you wish. Uh, see, my camera is now uh, paused. Uh, let's turn live view, uh, uh, sorry, the, the grid off. As I said, color or black and white, uh, preferences here. Uh, and then we've got customize, which means we can change various things on the toolbar up here you probably won't really have to have to do that as such um, if i want to start my live view again i can say play and then live view is active once more so if you want to pause it you can just say pause um, alberto is asking uh, what did fernando say is configuring the button for the back button uh, on the nikon and obviously and lots of other cameras uh, what's it called on the nikon it's called uh, af on so that's just a, a way to trigger the af so on the on the nikon um, uh, custom function menu i think it's a4 or d4 by memory i can't remember you can disable AF on the half press and send it to the AF on button on the back of the camera instead. So that's the way to do it. Uh, where were we? Now we've added a couple of other things uh, with Live View 2. Uh, we'll come to overlay in a, in a minute. Um, but what you can also do if Live View is running, let's just get Live View up and running. If I right click here, we can add some tools. So we can add the camera like so. We can add uh, camera controls like so. So we can actually shoot while live view is running. Uh, so if I wanted to make a capture, I can. So live view stops, captures made, you'll see it pop up down here, and then live view starts up again. So that's that's good. If you're, say, working with food or something in your, and you're carefully arranging your subject, you don't have to stop live view, make a capture, and go back in. You can just simply hit capture button like so, live view stops, camera captures, image pops up, uh, down here like so so that's a handy little thing if I wanted to adjust let's say I wanted to change aperture I can do so capture once more live view stops camera captures image pops up down there like so so that's a, a nice uh, little uh, additional feature as well now overlay is uh, brilliant if you're lucky enough to be working with an art director who has a clear idea of uh, what they want overlay allows you to uh, drag and drop uh, many kind of different image formats uh, like png jpeg tiff and so on and if i just take my little layout that i made earlier and drop this here if we click show then what i have is just like a, an art director's feeling of how the shot should be for a fake magazine of course uh, now we can adjust some things like opacity if you use a png then it's transparent so png is a good thing to use because then you don't get any background at all and it overlays nicely uh, on the uh, image uh, itself like so uh, you can change the scale so we can make it bigger and smaller um, 
double click the slider to reset to default and then you can change the position with horizontal and vertical uh, what this does mean of course while live viewers running if i've got enough um headset uh cable well then we can obviously do things like this you can see a, a hairy arm come in and then we could then fit to exactly how we want it although i can't figure out how to get it to go this way there we go and twist so you can see live view is really handy for uh, that kind of thing like so and luckily enough my layout fits um absolutely perfectly of course so layout overlay is good for that or if you're trying to match you know one shot to another you could easily drop in the previous image like just do a quick um, process recipe export as a jpeg drop that in so that you wanted to match like a series of portraits like head position or, or something like that a long time ago i saw a case where i was working with um, photographers shooting athletes and they were running fast left to right across the screen um, and they were modeling nike uh, trainer equipment uh, but if the clothes or shoes didn't fit them they wore their own clothes and then they had to get an assistant standing in the right position with the shoe on his foot so that that could be comped in later on so there's all kind of uses for overlay not just uh, uh, not just my uh, funny mock-up uh, that you see here Um, can you use live view combined with a Nikon D4 shooting 10 frames a second? Uh, probably not that fast because remember in live view mode, the mirror is up and the sensor is, is receiving data. Uh, so when we say capture, where's my camera? Uh, when we say capture, the shutter, the mirror has to go down, the capture's made, and then it opens up again. So I don't think you can shoot. I'm just going to try it. I don't think the shutter button works in live view mode. No. So in live view mode, you can only capture from uh, the software itself. So that's a, a, a good thing to know. Uh, Will is saying the studio lights don't fire in live mode. It should do. Just, again, get in touch with support. There's no reason why it shouldn't because that's, that's based on the camera, not on the... Um, not on anything to do with capture one but just get in touch with uh, with support uh rich is saying uh, on d800 exposure for live view is different than stills is the setup wrong no i think i tend to find that live view looks a little bit darker um but remember it's only visually for uh composition not really for judging uh exposure as stuff uh you can see the if we do a right click we can add exposure evaluation so this is showing my my current exposure based on the last image so if i do another capture as such and then if we look at the histogram will uh, refresh in a second like so uh, if i was to change my exposure compensation let's just make it really dark and say capture then obviously that's way too dark so i would read this rather than what you see on the live view uh, output as such so let's go up to 2.3 and capture and that's probably over yeah well a little bit but you get the idea rely on exposure evaluation not on how the live view uh, image is uh, is looking um okay so let's close down live view i think that's all we can talk about for that so let's uh go like so and that cancel live view out you can use overlay just in capture one uh, as well so that's in the uh details tool tab nope sorry composition tool tab <clears throat> excuse me uh, right here so just turn it on and off like so <clears throat> excuse me right uh hannah's asking can you take a still image of the overlay to keep as a record well it is i'll show you what my overlay is it's simply this so this is a little layout that i made in in photoshop earlier so that's all um but if you wanted to take an image of so that basically um there's no way to do that in capture one but i guess you could just do a quick screen grab like shift command four on the mac you could just do a a little screen grab like that for example um, and then that should pop up on your desktop yeah like so so shift command 4 on the on the mac 
Uh, okay, so let's have a look at Capture Pilot, I think, and then that will wrap us up uh, quite nicely. Uh, Bruno saying he's trialing Capture One Eight right now and loving it. Great. As a Lightroom convert, how do we deal with color management using Color Checker Passport to create camera profiles? Good question. Actually, this comes up a lot uh, in the webinars. Uh, let's have a look at base characteristics. Um, this isn't necessarily to do with tethered capture, but um, uh, it, as I said, this comes up a lot. Uh, the way Capture One works is that uh, we support, uh, we don't support file types, we support cameras is a good way of saying it. So we don't support everything that can do a NEF file, for example, we support certain cameras that can do uh, a NEF file output. So when we create the profiles, this you can see the ICC profile here, uh, we need to have the camera in-house in the factory. And we do a pretty excellent job of creating an ICC profile uh, for all kinds of photography situations. I would be surprised if you were, could get a better profile by using something as limited as the um, color checker passport. If you haven't seen a color checker passport, it doesn't have very many color patches on it. Uh, it would probably make a decent enough profile if you're in a situation where the lighting was locked down uh, and you were shooting like, um, you know, artwork, paintings, those kinds of things uh, where your lighting is constant, exposure is constant uh, and nothing changes. But to create a profile that is better than this one uh, for all kinds of general photography, I don't think you could do. Now, if you wanted to make a new profile, there's nothing to stop you doing it. All you would do is shoot your color target. Uh, probably something with more patches than the little color checker passport. And then you can see here that under other, you would basically see all custom ICC profiles that you have made, and you could simply choose it here. So it, you could use something like um, software from Xrite to build the ICC profile, and you could drop it in here. And our clients do that, especially those of those uh, those clients who are, as I said, copying artwork, doing scientific stuff, then they do create their own profiles for specific lighting situations. But as I said, I don't think you can do better than that for general purpose uh, photography as such. Um, Tom Bark is asking, is there a way to automatically back up images by tethering uh, without applications? No, not currently. Um, Tom's mentioned a couple of applications like Chronosync or Folder Watch, uh, which is what I normally recommend, but there is no tool in Capture One uh, where you can uh, back up simultaneously as such. Maybe it's a good thing for us to add, um, but currently uh, use uh, an application like Chronosync, for example. Let's pop uh, base characteristics back over here. Oh, if you wonder what these are, basically, uh, these are, let's just get a color image uh, back up. Let's just reset everything on this. Uh, get rid of the, my distracting overlay. Uh, what do you see here? Curve. Um, if you wanna try it, linear response, see that just gives you a really flat output. Whereas something like film standard, uh, applies a, a basic contrast curve to the to the image and you can see there's various different ones high contrast extra shadow uh, auto basically pairs the best curve with this ICC profile so that will automatically choose the best curve based on this ICC profile so linear response is good if you want to have a real zero starting point and add your own contrast in and so on and so forth uh, but let's just say auto. You're right, that is a pretty nasty dust spot up in the top left-hand corner, isn't it? Have to have a look at that. <laughs> well spotted, uh, Alberta. Okay, uh, Capture Pilot, last thing to, to talk about today. Um, I'm just going to get my uh, iPad. <coughs> Capture Pilot is um, an application that runs on iOS devices and also any web-enabled device. Uh, we, we'll deal with uh, Capture Pilot on um, Mac, uh, sorry, on uh, iOS devices first. Now, hopefully, I'm going to be able to show you my iPad uh, on screen with this application. Let's see if it works. Just bear with me a second. Yep, so you can see my uh, iPad uh, on screen now. Uh, let's just make this a little bit uh, smaller. 
Oh, that's a bit too small. We used to be able to uh, make it, uh, let's say, actual size. There we go. That's a bit more manageable. So this is my iPad that you're uh, seeing uh, uh, on screen now. Uh, so if we, the first thing we have to do in uh, Capture On itself is say Start Image Server. Now you have a few choices here in terms of what you can set up. Uh, so what images do you want to see? This is really good for controlling what the uh, client sees. So if you're on capture folder, that will just show us the current capture folder that we're using. Uh, we've got selects folder and output folder. We'll come to those once we've uh, had a look at um, capture pilot. For example, you could choose, I want to see five stars or all images, but let's just uh, look at the uh, yeah, let's just do the current capture folder that's got the most images in it, like so. So, shot one. Uh, publish to mobile and web. So, that means iOS devices and any web enabled device. You can set a password for security if you wish. Under mobile, this is for iOS devices. You can choose what kind of things you want to allow people to do. I'll just have everything adjust, uh, set like so. And for web devices, uh, there's not so much functionality, but people can still rate and color tag, and you'll see in a minute. So all I have to do is say start image server. Let's go back to my iPad and let's start capture pilot. Then you'll see it shows me the local servers, which is the still life shoe. So my iPad and my laptop are on the same network. So that's the stipulation. So we, uh, uh, you have to be on the same network. So if I tap on still life shoe, It'll load up and show me all the shots, and you can scroll up and down like so. If you look in the bottom right-hand corner uh, over here, like so, you can have small, medium, and large icons, for example. And then basically, if you click on, tap on, I've tapped on the image in the middle, and that opens it up on the screen. Uh, you see down here in the bottom left-hand corner, down here, I'll just show you with the mouse, you've got various different icons. The uh, Histogram, you can turn on and off. You can move that around anywhere on the screen. Uh, star rating, you can turn on and off. So if I give this five stars, uh, then it, it uh, adds the uh, rating like so. That will synchronize back to uh, Capture One. See that one there, number 77. It now has five stars. If I change this to three stars, you can again see it synchronize back. I could add a color tag like so, and you can see that's added. Uh, there as well. So that all synchronizes back. So your client can swipe through images like so. They can double tap to zoom into 100%. Okay, yep, we like that one. That's five stars and so on. Double tap to, to zoom out as such. Um, if I shoot, so if I go over to the uh, camera one second and make a capture, then basically that will update immediately on Capture Pilot like so. So, and pretty quick. So I do one, two shots. So there's uh, the first and, uh, oh, that just showed me the, the last one straight away. I think if you shoot fast, it won't uh, confuse you and flick up a load of shots. So if I do three captures like so, then you'll see them pop up like so. So it does mean you can monitor the, the shoot really nicely on, uh, on the iPad like so. Um, final one here, the camera icon. So you can see I've got all my camera controls there. So these are little slider wheels. So I could change aperture if I wanted to. Uh, I could change ISO. I could change my EV. If I tap on the square here, then I've got all my different camera parameters. And you can click and take a shot, like so. Now that may sound a little bit gimmicky. Why do I want to trigger the camera from the iPad? But if you're working uh, alone in the studio, this is a great way to be able to be close to the set, um, moving your objects around, triggering a capture, checking the lighting without having to go back and forth, back and forth to the capture station. Um, it's also good for your uh, assistants. If you've got a lighting assistant, uh, they can see the images pop in. You can tell them, look, that area needs X adjustment, go over there and then uh, adjust, and then you'll be able to see if you've done that correctly or not. So Capture Pilot has all kind of different tools. Or mount it next to your uh, camera, 
and then you've got an extra monitor next to your camera that you can use for zooming in to you know check for for focus you can spin it around and show it to the model for example as well so there's lots of different ways that you can use capture pilot tether tools who did the little nifty tether lock for the uh, uh for the usb cable um they sell all kinds of ipad mounting things as well to clamp to tripods and stuff like that incidentally if you have a canon 5d i saw a really good little gadget the other day uh, that canon sell that clamps the usb cable to the side of the body it screws into one of the accessory ports so that's a good option if uh, if you have a canon equipment um just scrolling down some questions um Yes, Richard, the ICC profile sets to whatever camera you use. So in base characteristics, you can ignore it pretty much. It's all automatic based on uh, uh, the camera. Yeah. Uh, Capture Pilot doesn't work with Android tablets, but it does work with any uh, web uh, enabled device. Uh, we'll come to that in a second. Uh, Marco's asking, says that the capture images appear on the iPad a bit slower compared with other systems. Um, it depends a lot on your wireless network and, and various things. Um, my laptop's on a wired connection. The iPad, obviously, is on a Wi-Fi network. And uh, it's not the greatest uh, wireless router, for example, for speed. I don't think it's the fastest. So it depends a little bit on that. But remember, it's got to go into Capture One first because Capture One creates the preview. And then the preview is sent to iPad. So there will be a little bit of a delay. But you'll see if I go to Capture One, make a capture, you can see it pop up. So it's, what is it, 0.2 of a second's delay? I think that's that's acceptable, really. And when we zoom in, it builds pretty fast as, as well. Um, Dominic saying, or Dominico, sorry, can you connect the MacBook directly to directly to the out uh, to the iPad without a network router? Yes, you can. Um, if you don't have a network router, um, if Wi-Fi is on, let's just turn Wi-Fi on. You can actually say create network, and the MacBook will create uh, its own network, basically, and that way you can have a, a direct peer-to-peer -peer connection. Apple made it less reliable with a couple of the last OS updates, but it, it is possible. The other option is just to keep in your pocket a little battery powered router. Um, there's there's a few of them you can buy on the market, or if you're working in a studio, just buy a really basic kind of like an Apple Express, um, Airport Express, or just any basic kind of Wi-Fi router, and just use that as your dedicated capture pilot station. It can be a bit slow if, for example, you're in a studio in the middle of Manhattan, and there's 50 different Wi-Fi networks and 100 people connected on the one you're using, then obviously traffic is going to slow it down. But if you have a dedicated one, uh, it works uh, really nicely. Uh, Live View doesn't work with capture pilot, no. Uh, it might be possible in the future so we just have to see but it's not impossible but we need to to, to explore it further yeah uh, another good tip from uh, uh, Alberto um, capture pilot is also useful if your camera has been mounted in a difficult position for example up high on the ceiling exactly so if your camera is in a tricky spot and you want to be able to you know work near to it but not have to uh, obviously access it, then it's great to be able to change settings and uh, trigger capture, for example. Um, in base characteristics, Niels is asking, what's the difference between generic and generic version two? Generic version two is just better. So, yeah. Uh, Tom, good tip from Tom. If you have an iPhone using a pers personal hotspot, it works pretty fast. Okay, that's good to know. Much faster than the ad hoc network from the Mac. Okay. I'll have to try that. So thanks. Thanks, Tom. So if you don't have iPad, iPhone, iPod, uh, et cetera, let's just turn this off for a second. Uh, you'll see here in Capture One in the web tab, you get an IP address. If I click on that, that takes me to a web browser. So if anyone is on the same network as you, if you give them that IP address, then they will be able to see the shoot like so. If they click on an image, they can see it. They can't go to 100%. That's the limitation with um, um, 
using uh, something other than the, the iPad or iPhone, for example. Uh, but they can still make a star rating like so. They can still do color tags. So they can do those kinds of things, but it's not as interactive uh, as it is uh, compared to the iOS application. What is nice, uh, I did mention it briefly earlier. If we go back to Capture One, uh, let's say in Basic, let's change this to five star images only. Now, if we have a look in Capture Pilot, see straight away, it's only showing me the five star images. So you can restrict what you want your clients to see. So it does mean that uh, if I now go back to capture one and say make this five stars this five stars this five stars straight away they're added to capture pilot that'll be the same on the ipad as well so you can very easily control what the client is uh, seeing uh, florian saying is it possible to only trans uh, transport the jpeg to the ipad well currently um you're not actually saving anything to the iPad. It's just temporary. So we're not sending raw data to the iPad or anything like that. Um, there isn't a facility to save those images to the iPad either. And um, that's mostly for security because in theory, anyone could join your Capture Pilot network if you didn't set a password. So it's just to stop people saving images or stop your clients saving images in the future. But maybe that's something we could add uh, a checkbox to say, do you want to allow people to save low resolution JPEGs, which you probably don't most of the time. Um, one last thing about sessions, which I kind of forgot, then, then we have to say goodbye. Uh, these folder here, capture, selects, and output, um, they're very simple. So let's say you're, you're working in a very basic session just with capture, selects, and output. If you want to, you can drag and drop to a selects folder and it will tell you files are going to be moved. Uh, every time you do this, you're going to get that warning, which is pretty annoying. Uh, so in preferences, under warnings, you can turn off warn when moving images and folders. So it does mean if you hide your viewer, like so, um, it does mean you can just easily drag and drop with the client your favorite selects from an image. There is a shortcut. So if you do Command J or Control J on the keyboard, Command J, then that does the same thing. So if I do Command J, then that moves that to the selects folder like so. Uh, if we look at the session it itself, then you can see now in the selects folder, I've got my selects like so. Um, you can actually use a cursor key. Some people like this move to selects folder. So if I choose this cursor, cursor control, every time I tap on an image, it goes to the selects folder. So that's just a, a really fast way of, of doing it as such. Finally, so you can see those images there in the select. So if we went to my selects folder, we could say, oh, these are the final shots from uh, today. Uh, not that one. Let's put that in the trash. Uh, so these are our final shots from today. And if we select it all and we wanted to output, so you could choose your process recipe. Um, process recipe is simply basically what's going on here. So these are the basic recipes you get with Capture One. Uh, you can add new recipes by saying plus. So let's say you wanted to have a 8-bit TIFF of all these images. I just need to select that recipe. And by default, they will go into the output folder, funnily enough. So if I've got 12 images selected and I say process, like so, now they start processing. This is blazingly fast now in a Capture One 8. Uh, so that's going to be about a minute to do 12 shots from a D800, which is pretty fast. And you can see them popping in, in there. So definitely uh, the process output speed is much, much quicker in version eight to version seven. Um, I think on my old laptop, this would be three or four times longer as such. Okay, um, before we have to uh, go, um, I just want to bring up something on screen just to ask your uh, answer a couple more questions. Uh, I don't know yet when the Sony functionality will be in place, Lewis, but we are working on it. Uh, yes, you can work in the same session on different computers, but not at the same time. You can transfer uh, sessions around, um, but 
uh, I wouldn't advise trying to access the same session at the same time. Um, can you export directly to SmugMug? No, but what you could do is make a process recipe that applies very well to SmugMug. If I just show you our um, IQP blog for a second, uh, if you type in uh, social media in the search, um, there's a good blog post here. It's based on Capture One Seven, but it's the same principle applies. So it's about creating recipes for various different uh, social media as such. So have a look at that. That's in the blog, blog.phase1.com. Uh, yes, Alberto, you can have subfolders in the selected folder. So if you wanted to have selects for each of your shop folders, you can. It doesn't matter. You can make the session look however you want to. And then in Capture One, uh, if you wanted this to be a selects folder, you can. In the same way as you set something to a capture folder, you can set it to a selects folder or set it to an output folder. So it's entirely uh, flexible. Javier is asking about Fuji tethering. Maybe you missed the question earlier. Uh, the, be, the way we can do Nikon, Canon, and Sony is because those manufacturers supply us with an SDK um, that allows us to do so. We don't have anything quite like that from uh, Fuji to enable us to do so. If you want Fuji tethering, then uh, get on get on to Fuji and ask them to provide something that, that we can use uh, as such. So um, we, we're open to support anything pretty much. We just need to have the tools uh, to do it. Uh, yes, Gene, I, uh, I can show you um, how to move a folder, uh, an image to the selects folder. Yes, uh, change the cursor tool to move to selects folder like so. Now you see the icon changes. Whenever I click on an image, it goes to the selects folder. Tap, 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 like so. So that's a really fast way to do it. Or you do command J, like so. Um, and for example, if you wanted to in Capture Pilot, you could actually set that to show the selects folder. And now uh, Capture Pilot um, uh, is showing just exactly what's in my selects folder. So if your client is sat on the sofa, then uh, this is a good way to uh, work with someone without having to be huddled around a, a monitor. Uh, yes, Stefano, you can um, open a session from a NAS server, um, but just be careful. It depends on how fast that server is. You might see performance uh, issues as such. OK, uh, let's um, one second. I just want to flick back to say goodbye to our uh, sorry, I'll get there in a second. Uh, flip back to say goodbye to uh, you guys. Uh, just so you know, uh, coming up uh, next week uh, is just a webinar on the repair layers. So that's new functionality. So heal and cloning directly on the raw file works really nicely. Uh, so we just go through the steps of using local adjustments and doing the repair layers as well. So that's next week. Sign up in uh, the usual place. Um, I can see a few more questions popped in that I didn't get a chance to um, get hold of. Uh, so I'll stay on the line for five minutes and I'll answer some of those uh, on text as well. I did record this session. So if you want to watch it again, you can. Um, you'll get a follow-up email in two or three days time and that will have a YouTube link where you can watch the webinar once more. So just hang on and wait for that and you'll, you'll be able to watch again at your leisure. Uh, there's also a survey in there as well, which will only take you a minute or two to answer. If you could, I'd be grateful and that just means we can uh, steer the webinars to what you want to uh, listen to. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you want to watch again, you can come back at uh, 5 p.m. Central European summertime uh, today and again sign up in the usual place. So thanks very much for your attention and see you all again soon. Take care.